welcome into EP Wealth's Informed Investor Market Update. I'm Ron Black. Joining me today, Adam Phillips, the Managing Director of Investments at EP Wealth. Let's take a look at the year. We just started another month, so we're one six done with the year. It goes by quick. The S the Nasdaq's up eight point four percent year to date on the leaderboard, followed by the S and P five hundred up seven point seven percent year to date. The S and P four hundred mid cap jumps in up. 4.6%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 3.7%. The Russell 2000 up 3% for the year. So all three major indices are doing well. A lot of people are starting to say, are we in a bubble? Let's ask Adam Phillips that question specifically. Uh, we've, we're have we through earnings season from the fourth quarter of 2023. So we have some data to value companies and value indices with. Um, what's your thought on the bubble question? Because um, a lot is being made of the incredible climb of NVIDIA and AI stocks. Um, but looking at the indexes, most of them, I'm seeing some breadth in them. I'm seeing a widening of winners and losers. A widening of winners, not losers. Yeah, absolutely. We get the bubble question a lot. I don't think this is a bubble. I think it's important, though, to set our expectations about what returns could likely be going forward. So what we've seen the last year plus is that leadership has been fairly concentrated among those. We always talk about the magnificent seven companies, those high flying tech or tech adjacent companies that have really led the charge here because of their outperformance. They now contribute or, or, or represent about 30 percent of the overall S&P 500. And so I, I think it's very different, though, than what we saw in, in the days leading up to the tech bubble bursting and that these companies are profitable. And in many ways, they they reflect quality because they have strong balance sheets. And so I don't think they are necessarily in a bubble. But look, we have gone uh, very far uh, in a very short amount of time. And so I think it's important to set our expectations over, over the short term here. We are pretty cautious. I think that expectations are high. And so what that means is that investors can get disappointed. Over the last couple of weeks, we saw a couple of uh, of stocks, some of those high flying names, not part of the Magnificent Seven, but certainly um, were were strong performers over the last year or so. Uh, Snowflake being one of them, very close to that uh, artificial intelligence theme, and then Palo Alto Networks uh, on the cybersecurity play. So um, both of these companies reported um, disappointing earnings, and and so they shed. Um, I think Snowflake shed about 20% and Palo Alto Networks down about 30%. And so I mentioned those just to highlight the fact that when stocks run as quickly as they have, uh, investors can, um, you know, they, they can start to ask, what have you done for me lately? And I think that just leads to uh, setting the bar that much higher and, and being open to disappointment. So that's what I think we need to be on the lookout for and why we focus on diversification and not... Uh, let's say, being bullied into owning, having 30% of our allocation in those uh, those Magnificent Seven companies um, just because the index does, right? We want to look at other companies because in, an, in a healthy market, we do want to see leadership uh, broaden out. We do want to see participation that is across many sectors of the economy. And so you, you mentioned it that just over the last couple of weeks, we are starting to see that broadening out. We're starting to see small cap now. I think it was up 3%. The Russell 2000 was up 3% last week. It is now in positive territory for the year. You know, looking at my screen today, um, the, the market's down, but uh, the broad market, the S&P 500 is down because technology and communications um, and discretionary, some of those uh, sectors that house the Magnificent Seven companies um, are are having a tough day, but most companies in the underlying index are actually up, and so that tells you that there's actually some some strength uh, underneath the surface, and I think that's actually a good thing, and one of the reasons that oftentimes the broad index doesn't tell the whole story. Yeah, and I should mention we record on Monday, so if you're watching this Tuesday or Wednesday, the markets are up. Um, Adam Phillips has not lost his mind. We're recording on Monday. Um, you talk about future looking. Let's talk about the past for just a moment. Last week, we got inflation data, the PCE. Um, this is a big one. They say that it's one of the favorite indices or one of the favorite uh, data sets that the Federal Reserve likes, Jerome Powell. Um, he's going to be in front of Congress this week, but he also is going to go in front of them with that inflation data that just came out. Any thoughts on Mr. 
Powell and his trip to Congress, as well as some of the inflation data that he's wrangling with. Well, so the inflation data came in, I would say hot, but it came in as expected. And I think right. a lot of people were on guard after the CPI number, the Consumer Price Index, another broad inflation measure, came in pretty hot a couple weeks before. And so I think a lot of people were positioned for, okay, what if this one surprises us to the upside? And the the core PCE number, again, the Fed's infl uh, preferred inflation measure, it came in uh, up four tenths of a percent on a month over month basis. On a year over year basis, this showed that inflation's up about 2.8%. And so still higher than the target, but the markets actually rallied. This number came out on Thursday. The markets actually rallied uh, in the end of the week. And I think it was really more of a relief rally. People just kind of breathed a sigh of relief that this number did not surprise to the upside. And it came in, although elevated, it was in line with expectations. Uh, and so I think that's really what we're seeing here. And, and I think a lot of people are, are really more just kind of giving this one a pass. January can be a little bit noisy when it comes to inflation data. And it's also just one month. And so if these numbers, if this is the start of a trend of, of this um, reinflation, I think that's something to keep an eye on. But for now, I think most people are, are looking beyond it. As far as this week, j Powell is testifying uh, before, uh, I believe it's the House on Wednesday and the Senate on Thursday. Uh, it's a semi-annual uh, testimony before Congress. You know, I, I think he's, whenever he's in the hot seat, it's it's never really pleasant to watch. I, I think what you're likely to see is uh, those, uh, you know, Democrats that he's uh, speaking to will likely pressure him or ask him why they aren't aggressively cutting interest rates here. Uh, and those on the Republican side are probably going to ask why uh, the Fed uh, is, uh, and, and, and the government is really uh, considering uh, tougher regulations here. And so I think those are going to be two uh, of, the, of the primary topics. You know, just as it relates to, I, I guess, a potential um, argument or, or response to Democrats or those favoring more aggressive rate cuts, you know, it, it's really, you know, you're looking at, at a stock market that's trading at an all-time high. You're looking at a bond market that suggests that um, that conditions are not too tight. If anything, they're 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 too loose. And I say that because we you know, February just ended and we saw over $170 billion of new bond issuance from from investment grade corporates. Um, and so that's just, you know, it's one of the indicators we watch, and this comes off a very strong January. And so the first, for the first two months of the year, in terms of overall issuance for these companies, these investment grade companies, it's the strongest two months ever. And so that tells me if people are going to market, if companies are going to market and able to, to uh, issue debt, and there's a lot of uh, appetite or demand for that debt, then, you know, that, that tells me the conditions are not too tight. The Fed is not, does not need to be in a rush to cut rates here. If anything, they need to be mindful of the fact that inflationary pressures still exist. The economy is still in really great shape. And, and so for me, that would, be, that would be the response. I don't know if that would really play too well um, with the Democrats who are really looking for um, some easing here, but, but I think that's the reality. Yeah. If I were to have a question for Jerome Powell, I'd be like, why are my grocery prices so high? Up 25% still since uh, pre-pandemic levels. So um, lots of hot seat buttons and questions to ask Mr. Powell. Then there's going to be the jobs report that comes out on Friday. Um, the employment data, that could be a market mover maybe. What are you thinking? Absolutely. I, I think that... Uh... There's a few things that are potential market movers, right, that, that we're focused on. And then there's always the the exogenous or, or one-off events that come our way that are market movers. But the ones that are, are on our radar are earnings season from a lot of those high-flying names. We're, we're pretty much done with earnings season now. And so now it's let's, let's focus on the economic data. That's inflation. That's jobs. And so jobs report... Uh, really the big event. Uh, it comes out on, on Friday. And so looking for the unemployment rate to remain uh, pretty low uh, at around 3.7%. Uh, it looks like the average estimate is for net uh, job gains uh, and employment gains of around 175,000 uh, over the latest month. And so these numbers would tell us that the overall jobs market is still pretty strong. Um, and that uh, we're not seeing massive layoffs. I think that we've seen a few hit the headlines here, but on the whole, even though there is some softening in the labor market, it still appears pretty healthy. I think that's the expectation. Now, if the number surprises in either to the upside or the downside, we could see markets move in response to that. 
Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think this is uh, this is really the main event that everyone's uh, waiting for coming at the end of the week. Let's get a little bit of color on the JOLTS report because that kind of goes with the employment data on Friday. Um, it's kind of a hand in hand. It's job openings report. Um, mm -hmm. Job openings, I guess, to me, that means our economy could be that much bigger if all those jobs were filled, but they don't have the labor for them. Or um, That's where I get kind of fuzzy. Um, what do we need to know about the JOLTS report? Well, so the JOLTS report comes out on Wednesday. That's okay. the job openings and labor turnover survey. It's it's another jobs number that we like to focus on. Um, it's not as timely. It's it's delayed by a couple of months. Okay. And so it, we kind of take it with a grain of salt. But I think it's been so important over the last couple of years when labor was in such high demand and we saw that the job openings just skyrocket and and you know at one point there were two open positions for every unemployed person right mm -hmm. and so there was i think that that's one of the reasons that we saw wages start to increase right it's supply and demand um and so we've started to see that come down uh that number is expected to come down to somewhere just uh slightly above eight million job openings but i think what's most Interesting about that one, or, or what I've started to, to see over the last few months, is the fact that the quits rate, meaning how many people are actually quitting their job voluntarily, separating from their job, um, and, and that number has been coming down. That number is actually back to the pre-pandemic level. And what that tells me is that maybe, even though it's still a relatively strong jobs market, maybe employees are starting to say, okay, well, maybe the grass isn't greener on the other side. Maybe I don't feel um, as confident as I did before that I can go and find another job or one that pays better, offers uh, better benefits, better working conditions, whether it's work from home, whatever it is, um, they're more comfortable kind of staying put where they have a, that job security. And so that tells me that maybe the perception among employees is starting to change, and maybe that's a potential crack there, something to watch. And so I think that's that's interesting. It's evidence of, of the labor market softening. And so that's what I'll be keeping an eye on. So let's talk about something that would make a James Bond villain very, very happy. Gold sit in an all-time high. Um, I'm in my 50s. Uh, my father cared a lot about gold. So generation above me cared about gold. My generation it never really meant much to us or at least to me and i'm not speaking for my whole generation but then the younger generation they seem not to even know what gold is but they do know what bitcoin is also near an all-time high gold is at an all-time high what does gold being an all-time high mean to you adam phillips so we don't invest in gold currently in, in the past we've had an allocation to gold within a broader commodities uh investment there was a time when we wanted to just diversify um, away from traditional investments like stocks and bonds. And we wanted to say, uh, hedge a little bit uh, the threat of inflation uh, and just get broader diversification in our portfolios. We don't have that in the portfolios right now, um, but um, but go yeah, gold is at an all time high. It's kind of interesting. you know. Gold is something that I, I think there's an ongoing debate about whether it's actually an inflation hedge or not, but we do see that it typically mm. um, does well when there is a heightened level of geopolitical risk or uncertainty. And so I think that's what we're seeing right now. It's interesting, you know, you you don't normally see gold rising or or I guess to say it another way, you wouldn't expect gold to be at an all-time high when stocks are also at an all-time high and bond prices are also elevated, meaning uh, 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 our, our, our uh, spreads are, are low, meaning that there's not a lot of risk in the bond market uh, or perceived risk. And so... Those things don't necessarily match up for me. It's kind of interesting, um, you know, and, and, it, and it kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, there's been a lot that's been said, even though the economy is strong, earnings uh, remain strong. A lot of people are wondering and, and saying, well, the stock market is at an all time high and we get why stocks should be strong. But do they really deserve to be at an all time high knowing about some of the risks here? You know, at one point, will investors really start to care about geopolitical risk, about bond yields, which have uh, started to increase a little bit here? Um, about the fact that inflation has shown signs that maybe it could be perking back up. You know, investors, stock stock investors have kind of turned a blind eye to it. And and so gold is one that, that you know, certainly is saying something different that maybe those, these are people that are paying attention to some of those risks. And so I think that's, that's what I find interesting about it is that some of these are giving conflicting signals about the broader macro picture. Uh, and so that's kind of what I take away from it is, is um, 
you know, it's, it's just kind of different interpretations of the world we're living in right now. Yeah, that's a good hot take on it, Adam. Um, again, uh, I always like your opinions way more than I like my own because they're quite informative and educational and they're, they're easy to digest, so to speak. He is Adam Phillips, Managing Director of Investments at EP Wealth. I am Rob Black. This is EP Wealth Advisors Informed Investor Market Update. Good day. Good day.